Yeah, you might recall this case. John Jamelski, I believe is the way his name is pronounced, uh, from Fayetteville, uh, then uh, lived in, uh, in DeWitt, which is just outside Syracuse, uh, was uh, picking up these young ladies, created a dungeon on his property, and was holding them against their will. Then one day, uh, this was after many years, he became a bit, um, a bit careless and felt so comfortable that he had befriended uh, his victims that he took one of them out to a karaoke bar. Uh, she then called her sister. Uh, her sister then called back, found out where the location was, called 911, and everything else then fortunately unfolded. One of those victims, her name is Jennifer Spaulding, and she's on the line right now uh, from the Syracuse area and speaking out in hopes that maybe this could help other young ladies out there. Good morning, Jennifer. Thanks so much for coming on. Good morning. How are you? Good. And uh, so I just told, you know, the karaoke story. Um, were you there at the time when, when that happened? No, actually, um, he kidnapped that girl after he had already released me. Okay. And, and so he had, so when were you, when were you kidnapped and when were you put inside this, this dungeon? I was kidnapped on May 11th, 2001, and he let me go on July 7th of 2001. And, and, and how, did he, how did he feel so comfortable that he could let you go without you reporting it to authorities? Um, well, he had told me that, you know, if I went to authorities that he would hurt my family and um, that they wouldn't believe me, yeah. basically. And um, when he released me, my mom took me to the hospital, and essentially I uh, ended up speaking to the police because it was somebody they, that I grew up with. The cop ended up being somebody I grew up with. So I trusted him, and I ended up telling him the story. But then um, he, Jamelski was right. The cops didn't end up believing me. They said it was too much like Silence of the Lambs. Mm. So for two years I went, you know, and he was free and, you know, he actually used to call me at my jobs and stuff, and I ended up quitting working because, like, he would, for those two years that he, before he got caught, he was, like, still calling me and wow. stuff. Yeah, so when he got caught, it was a huge relief. So uh, so uh, you did report it. You did go to talk to authorities, and they didn't believe you. Exactly, yeah. Wow. 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 And then it took, uh, so that would have been, when do you think uh, you called authorities? Uh, what year do you think that was? That was in 2001, the day that I was released, July wow. 7th. Wow. And describe what it was like there. Um, it was, you know, a dirty windowless basement. There's uh, two rooms with a bathtub um, in which you had to pour. If you are going to take a wash up, you had to pour water over you. And um, there was like a... a piece of foam to sleep on and that was about the gist of it hmm. there wasn't much there and how did you get were you in a did you go down a, a bad road were you a runaway were you involved in drugs what, what 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 was your story i was actually partying one night I, yeah i was on drugs and um i was actually going from one party to another party and ended up in a bad part of syracuse and with some young kids following behind me saying bad stuff and making me nervous so when an old white man pulled up i was i didn't hesitate to get in the car with him yeah and then uh, did he use drugs to uh to keep you uh contained to keep people contained there uh no actually once you like he knocked me out with chloroform to get me down there but once i was down there yeah um it was like um you know, I couldn't get out because there was, like, combination locks on the door. Okay, got so it. So there was no escape, basically. Yeah. And uh, did, were there, did he use the, uh, how, how many women, how many young ladies were down there with you? I was down there by myself. You were by yourself all this time? Yeah. Was there ever? He would yeah. play, like, I found out afterwards because I would hear other girls screaming. Yeah. Um, I found out afterwards that he had recordings that he would play to make me think that there was somebody else down there. Oh, by that it's just a whole mind game. Yes. Playing mind games with you. Yes. And um so uh, so he wouldn't keep multiple girls down there at one time. It would be one and then that person would end up being released. Yes. And uh, and what uh boy how how cocky and pompous you must be to be able to think that you can release somebody and you know no one's going to believe you and they're not going to say anything. But he was right in your case. Yes, he 
he was. He was. And it made me think that he, you know, he was working with the police. Yeah. Wow. And go ahead. Uh, well, Jeff. I just, uh, you know, thank God that he, ultimately he did release her. But, I mean, obviously, as you just said, it's just so shocking that you could be so brazen to do that and, and still continue to do it after you've let someone go. Yeah. He just goes and finds the next girl. What about, yeah. uh, were, were there sexual assaults? Yes. Uh, he, he made me uh, every day. Every day. Wow. Yeah. And was there a time that you, uh, and you hear this happen, was there ever a time where you began to uh, find yourself um, loving this person, caring about this person? Um, I didn't care. I always hated him yeah. and, you know, for what he did to me. But it was like for that amount of time when you're in that situation and you have no one else to talk to, yeah. uh, you kind of have to be friends. And that I think that's the worst part. Because I didn't want to be friends with him. Yeah, yeah. So I think that affects me more than, than any of it. And you say you were abducted. What year again were you abducted? 2001. 2001. And you were there for how long? For 56 days. Okay. Wow. So that really wasn't as long as, uh, as, uh, as one would think. Uh, it's, it's in, and because he began his abductions, I believe, like 1988, right? This was beginning to happen. Yes, yes. And some of the girls he kept for three years, four years. Wow. So can, can I ask, was there ever, I know you were there for two months, and in other cases it was three or four years. Was there ever, uh, Did I don't remember, did this guy have a family? Was there ever anyone else that you saw or heard? I know you, you mentioned the, he was playing those recordings to make you think someone else was there. But was this guy, he lived on his own and would just come down and stay with you? when he wasn't working or when he had free time or something. Can you talk about what his life was like? Yes, that's about the gist of it. Like, I didn't, I never seen anybody. I never, he never brought me out of the basement the whole time I was there. Hmm. Um, the whole 56 days I was there, I was in the basement. He never brought me out. He, um, I never seen anybody. I found out after that, you know, he has sons and he had a wife that passed. But yeah. I never seen anybody. I, I, I want to just uh, one uh, element of breaking news out there that uh, that just broke is the mastermind, according to French police, uh, has been killed. Uh, that uh, just came from AP just a, a moment ago. Um, Christine, you have a question. Go ahead. Have you spoken with any of the other women? Yes, actually, I have. Um, I was friends <laughs> with the first girl that he ended up kidnapping, but the other girls, none of them wanted to be friends. Yeah. Uh, you were how old when you? I was twenty six years old when you were kidnapped. Yes. And uh, and and tell about the uh, if you can uh, talk about the uh, the fact that he had convinced you that there was he was a part of this underground slavery syndicate and that the you know the authorities were were knew about it and uh, talk about what he what he had convinced you. Uh, yeah, he made me think that he wasn't working alone. Mm -hmm. That um, his bosses were like the police department and um he would show me passports and stuff of women and he told me that they would drug women mm -hmm. put them in a wheelchair and then bring them to whatever you know whoever was buying them hmm. uh and then when you did not do what he told you to do he punished you yes how did he do that um he used to turn off all the lights so it would be pitch black. Um, one time he burned me with a cigar. Um, he used to, like, because I'd be worried about air, because there's no windows. Yeah. And, you know, it was really, it's a basement. And um, so he had, like, this air vent that would push air in while he would turn off my air. And, you know, so he would use, like, the fear of darkness and, like, taking away my air. Wow. You are, oh, and saying that he would take away your air, that this is one of the things that he could do, that this was yeah. a far more complex facility than, he, than, than, than it probably looked. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and certainly that it probably was. And then, um, so then you, he let you go, um, and then you, how's your life been since then? How has it affected you, and how are you today? Um, actually, today I'm doing really good. I'm going to college for forensic psychology, and wow. um, I published four books. Um, and, but it does, it has affected me because, you know, I get really nervous to go out alone. I don't like to be home alone. I don't really like the dark. 
like I have to sleep with the TV on, which is kind of annoying. Yeah. I mean, is, do you now have this uh, situation where where white older guys scare you, or has that not affected you in, in no, that Oh, no, it doesn't yeah. affect me. Um, like, you know, if I'm out at the grocery store and an old white man will be like, hi, how are you doing? You know, just being cordial, I'll, I'll start freaking out and almost having a panic attack. Yeah. Wow, Andrew. Jennifer, um, you had mentioned that you felt like you were somewhat forced to be uh, friendly with with this guy when you were down there, and I, I guess I'm just curious as to what were the conversations about? Was he carrying on normal conversations with you? What, what would he talk about with you? Uh, yeah, he would um, have normal conversations. Like he would make me read the Bible to him. He taught. He made me teach him how to play poker. Um, he would talk about how they were searching for me on TV, and he thought it was funny. Because they said he said they were never going to find me, and so that's the kind of stuff that we would talk about. Yeah, I find it, it's just so amazing to me that the police wouldn't believe you. Obviously, there was probably a missing persons report. This was all over the media, and yeah. you just appear out of nowhere after fifty six days, and they and, and you try and tell them what happened, and, and they don't believe you. It's just it's just unbelievable. But you were you were, six, you were twenty six years old, so I hate yeah. to say this, but. You know, if you're not married, if you're not connected, a 26-year-old disappearing is not like a 17-year-old disappearing. People, exactly. You know, it people, it, it yeah. wasn't. And you, and you know what the thing was, was I had two paychecks for my job that I hadn't. Wow. And they had to make me new paychecks because they had expired. And they were totaling over $1,000, the two paychecks. Yeah. Wouldn't that, that be was, enough? That's what yeah. I tried to tell the cops because they were like, oh, well, you must have been out partying or something. And it's like, well, if I was out partying, why didn't I go get my paychecks? So you think you were, uh, based on the fact that you were using some serious drugs, that uh, mm -hmm. they just looked at you like you were a junkie and that you made this whole thing up? Yes. And that, I think that's very wrong that they yeah. did that. Uh, obviously, much uh, later, it was learned that your story was correct. And, yeah. um, and, and we're, we're talking. Yeah, the detective yeah. that actually didn't believe my story in the first place when Jamalski got caught, he ended up coming to my house and sat at my kitchen table and cried. Wow. And apologized for, for not believing Not believing you. And, and how, how do you feel about uh, How do you feel about that? I, I, I mean, it's kind of hurtful, and it's kind of one of the reasons why I'm going to school for forensic psychology right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, and uh, and we're talking to Jennifer Spalding, and Jennifer was one of the uh, one of the young ladies that was held against her will in this dungeon uh, outside uh, Syracuse by a guy by the name of uh, Jamelski, uh, John Jamelski. And this story goes back, really not back that far, about ten years, ten, eleven years ago. Uh, for you, it's it's further than that, but this was going on for a long, long time. Hard to believe that somebody could get away with doing this for so long. Uh, Andrew. So, Jennifer, um, just to ask a little bit now, are you uh, currently in a relationship with somebody? Have you have you been able to, to have a normal relationship with somebody now uh, in, in the wake of all this? Yes, actually, I've been with um, the same guy for 13 years. Oh, oh awesome. And it's kind of, he's kind of like a high school sweetheart because I've known him since he was 16 and I was 20. But he was too young for me then. Right. Got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then uh, where would you go to school? Was it Chittenango? Yes, I went to Chittenango. Chittenango High School. Uh, yeah. Tell me what, uh, what you want to accomplish here talking about this. I, I hope to help any, you know, young lady that – you know, thinks it's okay to get into a car with somebody that they don't know. Yeah. You know, that this could happen. And I'm know? assuming that when you're under the influence of some pretty serious drugs, you probably, maybe had you not been, maybe you wouldn't have made that same decision. Exactly, yes. You know, d don't do drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well. Say. And you, you said you have some books. Are the books about uh, what you went through? Um, I haven't gotten around to writing that because, you know, when you write, you write. You have to go back and relive it. But yeah. I wrote some poetry books, and those are the four books that I've published. All right, and uh, can uh, we find those anywhere? Can people search somewhere to find that stuff? Yeah, on Amazon, um, uh, under J.L. Estes. That's my pseudonym. Okay, all right. And, and uh, that, again, is they'd search for J.L. Estes, E S. E S T E S. Okay, we've got that. Yes. All right. Well, listen. Thanks so much for coming on and telling your story. We really appreciate it. And you know, thank God things have uh, have worked out really well for you. Thank you so much.
so much. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for letting me have the opportunity. Well, thank you. Jennifer Spaulding, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. We'll uh, take a break here. Wow. How about that story? Incredible. Got a um, break. Uh, we'll come right back here. It's WIBX. WIBX. <laughs> 